Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. Labor Day has come and gone. The campus parking lots are full again. Traffic is back to its usual grind. There's no apartment to be rented within miles of campus. Students are lined up to get their identification cards validated and their tuition paid. Notebook, paper, pencil, pen, and backpack sales are up. In short, welcome back to school. In today's episode, we are putting a different spin on the words, quote, back to school, close quote. Back to school rhetoric usually evokes images of teenage or 20 something men and women in jeans, t shirts, and backpacks riding bikes to campus and to their part time jobs. However, Laurie, Suzanne, and Tish are 40 something women who have had full time jobs and a lot of life under the bridge. They have chosen to come back to school after a long hiatus, having graduated from high school before most of today's undergraduates were born. They are what have become known as non-traditional students. Laurie is a grandmother who will be starting a diploma program this fall. Her three children are the age of most college students and are living independently as adults. Suzanne is a single mom whose kids were elementary school age when she decided to start a university program. She has just finished her BA and begins graduate work this fall. Tish has never married and has no children but has had a full career in the restaurant industry. She is augmenting her gourmet skills by going back to school in her mid-40s. She is in her last year of graduate school and hopes to be teaching junior college and writing books by this time next year. These women had more in common than their desire to further their education. They talk about how going back to school is bettering their lives and opening doors of opportunities for them. But it isn't a bed of roses, and their expectations have been tempered by the realities of school and the workforce. We talked with each of them this week about why they've chosen the non-traditional path, why it seems that women do this more often than men, and what they hope to gain as they work towards their goals and come back to school. Let's start off with a little bit about your educational history. Tell us about where you went to high school, what happened after that, why you didn't go straight to college. I went to high school in northern BC, and we moved up there when I was 15. I, up to that point, did very well in school, but due to crazy family of origin problems, I just wanted out. And so, even though I was finishing school a year early, I still didn't have that academic goal anymore of doing really well. And so when school was over in June, I decided to go to college and take a theater arts diploma in Prince George. I saved the money for myself and earned the money for myself, and I went off in September and did it. But <laughs> due to the crazy family of origin, when I came back home at Christmas time, I ended up staying with my family for a while. One of my sisters was pregnant, and it was a huge family drama, and so I felt that I had to be there. To help. So that was the end of that. I didn't finish Never the diploma. Why are you going back to school now? What's changed in your life that's made it possible or desirable for you to do so? Well, there have been a few times when I thought about going back. I have gone back for particular courses before, 
but this is the second time that I realized at the end of a relationship that I need to do something for myself and not just be taking care of other people. And so at this point, I decided, okay, now I have the freedom. I don't have to consider what someone else is doing. I can do what I want to do. I'm taking a fairly non-traditional course for a woman. I'm a risk taker, and often when you're in a relationship, the other person is not. For me, it's important to take the risks and go out there and do what I want to do, because after all, I'll be dead a long time. <laughs> How do you see this as a risk? I think it's always a risk when you are over 40 and you're, you go back to school and decide to do something completely different. I could stay doing the same kinds of things that I'm doing and do it forever and ever, and be bored forever and ever, maybe risk isn't the right word. It's a more creative approach, a different path than what I've been on. And I've been on a path where I was looking after other people for a long time. And by looking after, I mean looking after the emotional needs of other people instead of looking after my own. This is what I'm doing to look after my own self. When I started thinking about doing the show for this week and started thinking about friends of mine who were over 40 who had gone back to school in some way, shape, or form, I came up with one guy <laughs> and about 15 women. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this, I, I think that this is a female path. It is a female path because somehow, at least for women our age, we're still, even though I grew up not thinking that I couldn't do something because I was female, I just assumed I could do whatever I wanted to do. In fact, I didn't. In fact, I got married and had children, and I looked after them. It's not that I didn't work all that time, but I was working as a practical means and not as a creative end or beginning. Um, I think that's just typical. Men, generally speaking, look at their life, and at least I think, and go, okay, what am I going to do? Or I am choosing this path because this will be best for how I'm going to look after my life and my family. And women don't do that. Women operate from a feelings perspective a good part of the time. And so the feeling is to look after the family or look after the man or the relationship instead of looking after our own self. Mm -hmm. There's a dichotomy that's drawn sometimes by feminists in looking at male roles in society and female roles in society. And that dichotomy is between domestic life and public life, where men care about the domestic life, but they do what they do in the public realm in order to benefit the domestic life. But they don't really do much in the domestic realm. And women, on the other hand, to show that they care about the domestic realm, kind of stay behind that front door of the house and take care of that. So even as a working woman, I hear you saying to me, even though you went out and you worked and you did some very similar things to what men do in terms of providing resources for the family, providing money for the family and all, there was still this domestic life that you felt you had to take care of. Mm -hmm. I think... Um it may be, too, just the kind of person that I grew up to become, that I felt that I had to look after everybody else. Mm -hmm. I, I always knew in some part of my mind that, you know, I was smart enough. Why wasn't I doing something smarter? Why wasn't I doing something that required a brain, for instance? But at the same time, you know, uh, my own emotional needs were I had children, and I needed also to look after them and do a good job at looking after them. I think that, you know, there comes a point where you're, sitting watching Braveheart and going, what the hell am I doing with my life? And you go, okay, now I get to live too. Wait a minute, I remember I used to be somebody that cared about these very same things. Oh, well, I got the wrong impression. I thought it must be that you were tired of watching Mel Gibson movies. I'm not a big Mel Gibson fan. It was just that Robert the Bruce was a childhood hero of mine. At 10, I used to read English history, what can I say? I remember when I was sitting in the theater who I was at 10 and 12 years old, and where was I? I had gone this whole path where I put myself to one side, looked after the children, looked after the family, and I didn't do anything for my own self at all, apart from some little painting and you know things like this. But almost everything that I did was something that I did in order to produce something within the family, a sense of well-being for the children or uh, you know, money or whatever. So. I have two follow-up questions to that, and they actually will lead us down two different paths, so I don't want us to forget the other path when I ask the first question. I hear you saying something that I think is very remarkable when you look at feminist rhetoric about work and about women. I hear you saying you don't regret taking care of your children, putting them first for a while. It wasn't an either-or thing. It sounds like what you're constructing here is, okay, for a while I had to do this, 
and that was fulfilling. And then one day I realized there was this other thing I needed to do, and now it was time to move into that. Not, oh my God, I regretted having kids, I regretted doing that, and I lost myself. It wasn't that you lost yourself, it was that you put yourself aside and then came back to it. Is that a fair assessment of what you're telling me? Hmm. I would say sometimes I have regretted it. Not, I've, I've not regretted having children. I mean, I love them. I have regretted that I put myself aside that much. They felt it. You know, they've talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, they know that somehow, and they, they, this has induced some kind of guilt in them. They feel somehow responsible for the yeah, fact that I did this. That's interesting. They're smart. You know, that only just, you know, the whole guilt thing goes back and forth. So they feel guilty and I feel guilty because I made them feel guilty, you know. <laughs> so then they feel guilty, you know. No, I, I would say that's maybe a quarter of, the, of what's going on. The rest of it is, yeah, I did what, I made a choice. I chose to do what I thought were the right things to be a quote-unquote good mom. And that's what I did. And I did a good job. I think I did a good job. Mm -hmm. um, they mostly think I did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, they say I never said no, and that's very important to me. So, no, the other rabbit. Mm. How is education? How is going back to school a way of finding you, of following your yourself, for lack of a better way to put it? You used the word creative earlier. I take it you meant creative from the standpoint of personal development. Mm, I think I mean creative also, just actually creating things that are not. Um, centered around the domestic scene, you know, allowing my mind free reign to do what I want to do without having the, those constraints of making sure that what I was doing was not affecting the family status quo. So you meant creative in these little used sense of getting out of the house. <laughs> I mean that before all of my creativity went into making sure and ensuring that the family was looked after, and now my creativity is going to go wherever the hell it pleases and fuck off everybody else. Does that make sense? Yeah. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> but I think I missed your point now. <laughs> Patty. What I was asking was, are you anticipating this to be a opening up, a broadening of yourself? Because an opposite argument can be made about education as being very limiting. So oh, I, Yeah, I understand that. I homeschooled my children for part of the time because mm -hmm. of that. But definitely a broadening. And the reason is not because I'm going to be um, taking a narrow set of classes, if you know what I mean, like a, mm -hmm. a narrow path. But because what I'm learning is something I already know a little bit about. What I'm after is I want a certificate at the end, um, and I want to interact with other people doing the same thing so that I can learn. It's not that I want to go sit in a class and be read to. It's that I want to learn. For me, the broadening is going to happen because I'm, in a sense, forcing myself into a schedule of um, interacting with other people. Instead of staying at home and sitting by myself behind my computer and learning more about what I already know, I'm going to go and talk to other people and interact with other people and learn. It's more creative, more in intuitive. That's interesting because that's exactly the way I felt about my education. I didn't see it as necessarily a credentialing, though you know I was happy to finish the PhD and get the credential. But my primary goal was to find a place to think about and write about and have the space to do things I was already thinking and writing about but had no space for in my life mm -hmm. and didn't know anybody else who had who was into that either. Mm -hmm. I guess I didn't think about it in these terms before I went, but I saw school as like the place I could go, an institution that I go, go to and meet people who thought the way that I thought. And I didn't want it to be limited to that, and I didn't particularly care whether I was good at what I did. The grades I got, I got because I was interested in what I was doing, not because I was competitive with the other people there. And I think that that was wholly different than my younger counterparts. One of the things, I wonder if this rings true for you, Chris, you're kind of at the beginning, so you may not have enough experience right now to, to say this, but I wonder if that rings true to you that somehow being going back to school later in life when you have some life experience under you, when you have a perspective, it's not as intense, it's not as competitive, you don't feel as much constraint on doing it perfectly. You know, the permanent record thing just isn't intimidating anymore after you've uh, changed diapers. <laughs> I would have to say two things about that. One is that I've been back to school for a couple of different courses previously, a couple of bookkeeping courses. You know, they, were, they took place in the high school, and it was very part-time. And it was extremely competitive. Every single one of us were like, if we got one mistake wrong on a test, we were angry. 
I'm thinking I may be that way, and it won't be about credentials. It's I'm an adult, damn it! I should be able to do this. I don't know. I'll see what happens. I'm, you know, I'm probably a little more flexible than I was. That was about ten years ago. But I wanted to go back to what you were saying about you're going there when you're going to a, a class or a school or a college for a social atmosphere in a way. It's community. What I want is community in a whole sense with people that are doing the same thing I'm doing in order for us all to grow and learn. Mm -hmm. Because for me, that's the way I learn, by talking, by checking things out, by looking at what somebody else is doing, by the constant interaction. Um, and that's what I need. And I also need structure because being the arty kind of person, I can be very undisciplined. Because as I said, I, I, don't, I don't have to go the type of job that I'll be getting in the end. Uh, it requires a portfolio, not a certificate, even though the certificate is something that I personally want. Mm -hmm. um, it, it won't be in the portfolio. Nobody's going to care. Mm -hmm. They're going to look at my work and say, is this good or isn't this good? But it, the sense of community is what I need. In one way, I mean, it's very practical to go back and go into a community. I'm overusing the word because you're, you make connections this way. This is a good thing when you're looking for work. But for me, it's definitely the social aspect of the community is extremely important. I need to see what my peers are doing and interact with my peers. And in this case, peers aren't, is not an age issue. It's a mindset. Any last words? It's yeah. traditional. <laughs> <laughs> I would say if you're out there and you're thinking about doing something, do it. Don't wait. Because you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you know, you don't know what's going to come around the corner in your life. But still, I would say, don't be afraid to take a risk. You're only going to live the one time. So you can be willing to check back in with us after you've had some of these courses <laughs> sure, and yeah, get your that. certificate and give us the perspective from the other end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, Lori. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV. 101.9 FM, Victoria. All right, well, tell me a little bit about why you decided to return to school. Well, it actually was, I suppose it was a return to school, but I had actually dropped out of high school, so I had never attended college. I, um, for uh, many years, I did things sort of outside of the system for a living. Mm -hmm. um, for it, throughout my teens and 20s, I did uh, things that were sort of outside of the law as well. And then when I started having kids, I uh, did a lot of freelance stuff, had my own daycare for 10 years. I uh, was kind of cynical about, quote, unquote, the system and also about the educational system. Mm -hmm. um, but it was getting harder and harder to really keep my energy for working outside of the system and I wanted to um, get some kind of license so that I could, you know, have some kind of authority, work within the system for mm -hmm. change, rather than trying to work from without. Was there any kind of particular event that happened that sort of said, okay, this is it, it's time, or was it just sort of a gradual thing? It was fairly gradual. I started doing a training um, in an alternative form of therapy with this woman named Beth Roy, she had been practicing this, uh, she had a practice for about 30 years, and she was never licensed. She was a Ph.D., but in sociology. And she, from time to time, would train groups of people to do what she did. And I got into one of her trainings, and uh, I decided, as soon as I got into that, that I didn't want to um, try to set up some kind of a practice without being licensed, that I was tired of being outside of the law and outside of the system. And I think at that point I decided to look into going back to school to get some kind of license. And I found out at that time that I could get various grants so because of uh, being low income I could get state grants I could get federal grants to do undergraduate work okay is it your intention you said you're starting graduate school now right right is it your intention to go all the way through to the PhD or an MSW or well I'm, I my intention is to go through to an MSW and I'm actually considering law school at the moment so ah. which is kind of a leap and I don't know yet if it's something that I want to do and if it is something I want to do if I want to um, start next year or finish this this MSW program is a two-year program. Yeah. So um, I don't know if I want to finish this program and then go on to law school. I don't know if I have the stamina for this much school. <laughs> but, uh, I, now, you know, I just decided to, to look into that. I giggle because I understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and this much, you know, I'm really building up quite a, lo uh, a debt load here. So 
Yeah, I understand that. Too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you have certain expectations when you went back to school about what just the education itself would do for you? And well, I my expectation was that it would uh, was was for a lot to a large extent about economics uh, that I would have a way to make a um, more secure living. Mm-hmm. I didn't know if I would have to go on to graduate school in order to do that. And that was kind of a surprise to me to learn, once I had a bachelor's degree, how little it actually meant in terms of making money in the world yeah. um, compared to not having one. It didn't make very much difference at all, actually, in this in San Francisco sure. and the Bay Area. So I knew, really, that I had to go on to graduate school to make that four previous years worthwhile at all. And I was willing to, but it, it's a lot of work to be doing this as an adult and have kids. And I think I had an expectation that I would enjoy the um, academics of it, and uh, I think that I would if I weren't so torn in, fo- in my focus. Right. So, um, H- How old are your children? They're 10 and 14 now, so they were 6 and 10 when I started. You're, I'm hearing that you haven't really had, that school hasn't exactly turned out the way that you thought, that your first... Uh, expectation well, a little was bit that, of it hasn't. You know, yeah. just, I sort of had an expectation that I'd have time to read and enjoy the reading, but um, that's more about my life than school. I went into it pretty cynical, and I and I remained that way. Although I have sort of more, um, I have more basis for my skepticism and, and criticism now. Mm-hmm. But um, I, you know, I'm just generally a critic of everything. So <laughs> <laughs> probably rightly so, though. <laughs> Do you anticipate that the MSW will will get you where you're hoping to go? Yeah, definitely. There's there's really a demand for um, licensed social workers in this area. Mm-hmm. And at the moment, there is, and um, the program I'm in is, is quite it's it's quite a competitive program because it's one of I think it's the only one in in the in the northern part of the state besides uh, there's one other one. There's a big demand for social workers right now, and the schools have not caught up to that. They will in three or four or five years, but at the moment. I'm pretty sure that uh, I won't have a problem getting some kind of a job that I want and making a decent enough living. Okay. One of the things that I noticed when I started thinking about doing this show is that when I sat down and thought about all of the 40-somethings that I knew in uh, that were either had gone back to school or were in the process of going back to school, that I could think of maybe two men and, like, 50 women. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if you've observed that. Do you think that women go back later in life? Is there a difference between men and women along this line? I don't really know. I mean, I, in my own experience, I know a few men who have gone back uh, part-time. I know that sort of in my mother's generation, uh, it was typically women who would go back to school after the kids were grown. I, you know, in my experience in, in the undergrad school, school that I was in, uh, I was in the regular sort of daytime humanities program, but they had a program there called a weekend uh, bachelor completion program, which if you had some college credit, you could complete your bachelor's in a year by going to school on the weekend. Right. And w- I took some of those classes, and that was all adults. That was all adults around my, you know, in their 40s and 50s. Right. And there was a mix of men and women, although, um, you know, there was, you know, it was actually there were... in. A, very few white straight men in the classes that I was in. Right. I don't even know if there were any. There were some African American men who were middle aged, and there were some white gay men. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure what that means, but um, that's just my own sampling, which okay. is pretty small. I don't really know. In the in the program I'm in right now, I'm really the oldest in my particular class. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, most everybody is in their. Tw- well, I shouldn't say everybody. Uh, probably there are a handful of us who are over. 35, maybe. Most most everyone is in their 20s. And this is in graduate school? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I, I noticed a big difference. Of course, I went to a commuter school, and okay. so there were quite a few people that were older. Um, the average age there was 27 or 28 for yeah. attendees at the school. But I noticed in graduate school that the age actually went up. I turned out to be kind of in the middle. Oh, in my early 40s, there were, I, I knew plenty of people who were older than me as well as people who were younger. So, But it might, yeah. be, it might be location, too. Yeah, so. yeah, I think so. I've, I've had some classmates say to me who were, you know, in their early 20s, say, oh, I haven't been to school for four years. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I just look at them thinking, wonder what they think I am. <laughs> like yeah it took me 20 years to do my bachelor's degree (laughs) but when I taught that was kind of nice because I had a lot of students who were like freaking out because they weren't going to finish in four years oh yeah and I said you know you you get done when you get done yeah right (laughs) so it was almost 20 years to the day from the first college class I took to my graduation day well that's a nice leisurely pace yeah (laughs) I wouldn't exactly call it leisure. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so, you were talking about you, you know a lot of younger people in your classes and so forth. Um, did you Have you noticed much difference in the way that they approach school and the way that older students approach school? Well, I don't know. This, the, the program I'm in right now is it's so new. This is only the second week. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I mean, what I did notice last week, there's a big difference between the two schools. The undergraduate school I went to was a very small private liberal arts college and um this is a big state university really competitive and i noticed that the students in this program um who are younger tend to be really so far what i've noticed sort of seems sort of frantic and uh focused yeah on um you know making sure they're in the right place making sure they have all the sure they know what to do and it, the energy is completely different in this program maybe i look that way too i, I sort of felt that way the first day <laughs> Uh-huh. Um, and the other school, it's um, the people that went there were younger. I mean, they were in their 20s, but not necessarily right out of high school. And um, that was a school that, you know, sort of the basic philosophy was already questioning the institution of education. So right. there was a lot of, it re- a real big difference in the feel, feel in mm-hmm. the energy and in, in the way that students approached it between that school and this school, I would say. Anything that you want to add in terms of... Uh telling me about why you like, why you're going, why you're not, what you expect, any of this stuff that I've asked? Um, I don't know. I guess I would say um, I, I think it's wrong that it's so hard to get an education. At least my experience has been that it's been hard. A lot of people that, that I know are not even going to be able to, to get an, as much of an education as I've gotten. So I do. I still have enormous criticism for the way that it's structured, mm-hmm. and um, and for you know the way you sort of get lost when you're in the system and end up you know really focusing on getting a degree and uh, rather than really learning. And that's just sort of my lifelong criticism of the way education is most education structured. I have a daughter that I was going to homeschool, and she didn't go to school till she was uh, eight. Uh, mostly because we both got really lonely. We really didn't have community of people who weren't in school. Mm-hmm. And she is very, um, she's very intent on going to college. She's really focused on education, mm-hmm. and um, is sort of, you know, skeptical of my criticism. She's she's thinking that I might be unnecessarily critical. So we'll wait and see, you know, how it goes for her. And I'm really supportive of her doing that. It's something she really wants to do. She's in a college prep high school, and she's really like interested in college. And I'm glad. I'm not. I'm not mm-hmm. wanting her not to go to college, but, and I'm really interested in supporting her. Um, I was not supported to go to college, so I'm really planning on being able to support her. But it's just, it's just interesting to see the, the way that she's approaching it. Yeah, you said one thing that I I know that at the end of my schooling, I felt this. Um, you know, I'm the, like the first person in my family to get a PhD first uh-huh. person in my generation, both sides of my family, my mom's family, my father's family. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, not just my immediate family, but my extended, like, no, I have no cousins or uh-huh. it, or aunts or uncles who have advanced degrees. Uh-huh. And I remember, you know, at the end of this, when I finished the PhD, I thought, this doesn't prove that people can do it, because I know I have very intelligent people that I'm related to who right. just through the circumstances of life and right. their ability to pay and right, so forth exactly. that the education system doesn't encourage them to come forth and learn this kind of stuff. Exactly, yeah. I, yeah. I've had an enormous amount of support to do what I'm doing from, from community. You know, I have all of my grants and loans, but it's still not enough to support me in this town. And yeah. I work two part-time jobs, but I've had, you know, I'm right on the margin. So if my car breaks down or if my computer breaks down, I'm borrowing money from friends, and I happen to have friends who can do that. Yeah. But uh, so many people don't. And so there's no way that they could do what I'm doing. Yeah. There's they such, don't have that cushion. You, 
you luck out in some ways, but you also have to like just work really hard at building that support system in order to yes. make it happen. Right. And I know at the end of at the end of the education, I must had a guilt feeling about it for a while. You know, huh. it's like, and and also a great fear that there would be other people who would say, "Well, she did it, so it obviously could be done." Uh-huh. And it isn't easy. Right. It wasn't easy, and it shouldn't be that hard. And I do have a lot of, I guess, for lack of a better word for it, resentment that it was that hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just because I did it doesn't mean that it was an easy thing to do. Right. I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. And I imagine it's it's. I have friends who are starting school who are you know their kids are young and I don't have children, but I've um, have friends who have children. And you know, I'm I'm supportive of them going back, uh-huh. but I know that you sit there and cringe because you know it's not going to be as lovely <laughs> as. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but you know, that's one of those things that a lot of people have to find out for themselves. So. Yeah, I'm, and, and I don't I don't know anybody actually who's um, who has kids who's not doing something that's like carrying them in several different directions, whether sure. it's their job or, you know, I don't know any stay at home moms anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you very much for uh, being a part of our show. Thank you, Patty. And we will, uh, I'm sure that we'll meet again on the net. Yeah. If not, talk in person again sometime. Okay, take care. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 104.3 cable and on the internet cfuv.uvig.ca giving sociology an edge <laughs> Why did you decide to return to school? Well, I didn't really return to school because I didn't go to school in the first place. Um, I I had a single mother, and she worked really hard to make sure that she had money and resources so that I could have gone to school. I I didn't, you know, it was the 60s, and I was a hippie chick, and I didn't trust the institutions, and I thought I'd get a better education in the streets, so I never went. So when I decided to go, I was in my mid-40s. I'd worked as a cook most of my life, and I thought I might, if I got a degree, I might be more marketable professionally, so it really was kind of about economics. Was there anything specific going on in your life at the time that said, this is the right time to go? In a way, I had just quit a job managing a tourist restaurant in North Beach here in San Francisco, uh, in which I was making a a lot of money. I was making a six-figure salary, and I was, er, is that right? Yeah, I, I think I always say that wrong, but I was making a lot of money. But I hated life, and I knew that if I didn't do something, I was, you know, just doomed, because I really, really was really unhappy. So about a year after that, I started just sort of mumbling about maybe I should go to college, maybe I could be a therapist, maybe I could be a teacher, maybe I could be blah, blah, blah. And a friend was going to a small alternative ed kind of hippie college and took me down there just to show me around. And it was a pretty one thing led to another kind of thing that happened at that point. You said that there were economic reasons. What what are you hoping to get out of your education? You know, it's interesting because I have th- that's really divided. I mean, I'm always hoping to get out of my life, and this is true before I went to college. I'm always hoping to get learning. It is not that I don't want to learn in college. I mean, I definitely want to learn in college. I just don't think you have to go to college to learn. I always read a lot before I went to school. So, but but I mean, since I'm there, I'm hoping I'm going to learn something. I'm hope I'm going to be get engaged with other people who are engaged in the process of of learning. But the, the at the end of the day, it's about getting the letters that theoretically, hopefully, possibly make you more marketable in terms of getting jobs that I don't right now have any credibility to, to get, like teacher, uh, well, teacher right now, basically, mm-hmm. is the thing. So then it becomes about economics, because, you know, I, I want, I you know, I, I my resume looks great as a restaurateur, but not so great in any other way. Is school turning out to be what you want it to be? I went to school. I walked around my first year of school saying, I'm in college. <laughs> like, it was, well, what does it mean? You know, I mean, I, I really didn't have a big, even when I started going to school, I didn't have a thought about what it was going to be. I was, if anything, I was worried that it wasn't going to be 
you know, interesting enough that it was that they were going to try to just sort of make me memorize and regurgitate information, and that it wasn't going to be that interesting. Mm-hmm. Because I went to this small, silly little school. Um, it was pretty great. Um, it was really compelling. Those classes were small. Conversations were pretty interesting. At the same time, and and in, and now in my graduate school, there's a similar. There are times when we get really good information, and conversations conversations can be really great. But I also find that I'm um, very often the oldest person in the classroom, and a lot of people. Are, you know, younger people are as I was when I was younger, and this is also a generalization, but they're more interested in sort of partying and having fun and living their life. And so the reading becomes a burden, the writing becomes a burden, the joy of learning becomes, you know, something that they have to do like a job. So the conversations become, you know, people don't do the reading, and you can't have a conversation about the reading if people don't do the reading. <laughs> so, so I kind of go there with this real, I just read this is so great, I want to talk all about this stuff. And, and I very often, there's these sort of dull eyes. As I look around the room, and I'm sure teachers experience that regularly and with great frustration. And also, I just think that there's a way in which America makes learning bad. You know, learning dumb. It's only the geeks that read and learn and care about that stuff. And the rest of us are too busy or being hip or, you know, being trendy or being fashionable. You know, if, as long as you're keeping up with MTV, it's all good. And so I think America kind of, I mean, I even heard Howard Zinn in an interview on C-SPAN yesterday. He used a word that I don't remember, but it was a, a bigger word. And he made a little joke about using the word because it reflected his education. It reflected the fact that he'd been a, college, a professor in a university. Mm-hmm. When he, I flinched when he did that because I know that Howard Zinn is a very class conscious man and I know that he would never want to be put offish to anyone because they didn't know the word and I sort of might be willing to extend that that's the reason he did that but I just kind of want people to love words and love language and love learning and there's a way in which in America that's just not true I mean I I think it's it's become this really oh my god you read I I have been made fun of in my college for using a big word my my fellow students will roll their eyes and go where'd you what what's that word about I find that really sad and kind of tragic yeah, you would think that a college would be where you would be allowed to use words. Yeah, and love words and think they're interesting and fun and great and, and not, not, I mean, they, all, they become a dividing line up between people. And I think that's very much about race and class and gender and ethnicity and all those things because, because of traditionally who gets to learn the words, who gets to take the time to learn the words. Yes. It's interesting because I wonder sometimes when I when I started thinking about doing this show, I sat down and thought about who I knew who was a non-traditional student or whatever right. that means. Uh, I thought of maybe two men right. mm-hmm. and, I don't know, 40, 50 women. Right, right. <laughs> the proportion seemed to me way out of whack. Yeah. Is that your experience too? I mean, if you do run into people in your classes, do you find that the people that are your age I are, fu- I find are female? I'm not sure exactly how to put this, but I've noticed that the timing is different in a woman's life. Yes. That we think about domestic things and family and so forth and taking care of others earlier in our lives and it takes us a while to get to the point where we say okay it's it's our time. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that was certainly truer in my well, you know, I sort of think, I think in my mother's generation, I think in the baby boomer generation, there was a way in which our parents really wanted us to go to school because they didn't get to. I mean, that was certainly true about my mother, and I know a lot of my contemporaries, or even the women. I mean, I think a lot of, a lot more women went to school kind of in that age cohort. Yeah. At an earlier time. But I do agree with you. And I also think that a lot of women leave school because, you know, they, they get pregnant or. You know, they decide, well, I want to work on having my family now. So Yeah, I know in my own case, my first husband's education came first. Right. And you hear that a lot. You hear that the deal that is made is, I'll, you know, you get me through this school and then I'll get you through that school or whatever. And the deal falls through when yeah. the turnaround comes. The door, divorce happens at an interesting time yeah. in that uh, and yeah, I think there's a lot scenario. Of that. Yeah, a lot of that. I do think that the baby boomer generation saw more women going to school, going to college, you know, from the middle class. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I think you and I are both old enough to even remember that in the late 60s, a lot of schools weren't even available to women. Yes. That there were still all-male schools. Oh, yeah, definitely. And and also, women got funneled into liberal arts and... MRS degrees. Right. Right. (laughs) (laughs) You mentioned... 
how you felt like the younger people in your classes, some of the younger people in your classes regarded school as more like a job and right. something that they weren't really enjoying as learners. Do you notice any other differences between people who come to this later in life than, and people who just sort of like go from high school straight into college experience? Yeah, I think, when you know, and again, these are all generalizations that I always sort of feel the need to qualify that, but... You know, for for people my age, there's sort of a little more internalized fear that we aren't going to do it well enough or get it done, and we're tireder, and, and you know, it's a little harder. And I think that for older people, people there's a little more intensity because there is an internalized sense that you might not be able to do it, that you might be too tired, your brain might not keep up. It is harder. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm up, I went to school when I was sort of perimenopausal and menopausal, and you know, my brain definitely doesn't work quite as well as it did when I was in my 20s, although in my 20s I was high, so maybe it does work as well, and <laughs> for different reasons, I guess, if I really want to think about that. And, you know, I had a very interesting conversation with a young man once about the fact that he went to high school, he went to school, it was this regimented thing. I mean, he was, he, the only difference between his, in some ways, he's still lining up in the halls outside of his classrooms. You know, whereas for me, college is this opportunity to spend this time reading and writing and, and talking to other people about ideas and learning. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's an opportunity for him. It's more of the same thing he's been doing for the last period of time in his it's life. It's all he's ever known in some ways. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I appreciate your talking to us today. Hey. And I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed it very much, too. I enjoy the show. I, I tune in every week or every week that I am conscious of the time. <laughs> it's been a couple of times when I sort of wake up around 1 o'clock and go, oh, God. So, so we can advertise this as, if you're one of our biggest fans, you'll get a chance to be on our show. <laughs> there you go. That is that is the deal. We may Tune use in. that as a promo. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, thanks a lot, Tish. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Take care. Uh-huh. One of the things that struck me about the three interviews this week with each of the women was that a big part of going back to school later in life is changing your economic circumstances, specifically looking for credentials. Suzanne talked about this most explicitly, but Tish talked about it to a certain extent, and Lori talked about developing a portfolio for her line of work. And it reminded me of Peter Drucker's post-capitalist society and his discussion about the accountable school towards the end of it. He predicted, this book was written in the late 80s, early 90s, and he predicted in this book that education would take a very practical turn towards preparing people for work in a knowledge-based society. He said that the social position of school as, quote, producer, close quote, and, quote, distributive channel, close quote, of knowledge and its monopoly are both bound to be challenged. And he suggests that there's going to be much more competition among schools and that this competition was going to lead to schools that would be held accountable for how well they prepared people for their corporate positions, for their jobs in society. And I had, as you can imagine, a really bad gut reaction to his ideas. I don't like the idea of schools being judged merely upon how well they produce laborers. And he put it in post-language, making it sound like it was something wholly different than that. But in truth, I think that's what the bottom line was, that he was, in fact, suggesting that the whole purpose of education should be to provide laborers for a knowledge market. And Michael Harrington was writing about exactly this in the late 60s and early 70s. He was writing about the disparity between the academy the preparation that took place there and what actually happened to people who got out after their time at the academy into the so-called real world. 
He was talking about the gap between, quote, preparation, close quote, and what actually happened. The academy was raising these people, speaking of students in the late 60s, to be, quote, gentlemen, close quote. He, of course, meant the women as well as the men, and I'm sure he knew the term was archaic, and deliberately so in context. Mm -hmm. And the students were finding out after they got out that, in fact, what the world wanted was engineers. Harrington, I think, blamed the real world more than the academy. So he wasn't calling for an educational system to prepare engineers only? I would say that he would call for the exact opposite, were he to call for anything. He was calling for a world that would define knowledge worker as something other than engineer, or would consider the possibility that it could be defined some other way, which yeah. I think is Drucker's definition. When he says knowledge worker, he doesn't mean person of letters. He means engineer. Well, he means technician. He means somebody, Yes, that's a better word, technician. Yeah. He means someone who can manage information, can create knowledge that is beneficial to the larger entity, to the economy. He means it in very economic terms. Education for him becomes one more institution that supports what he calls the post-capitalist knowledge economy. What Drucker leaves out of his analysis, that the more people gain these credentials, the more the market gets glutted with credentialed people, the more you have to go after more credentials, and substance gets lost. It goes back to what Tish was talking about, where we don't want to use too big of words here, we don't want to worry about reading or anything like that. What we're worried about is having those little letters after your name so that you can compete with other people who have those little letters after their names. That seems really antithetical to the idea that knowledge would be a commodity. I mean, we're rejecting knowledge and only trying to look. It goes, it's sort of Baudrillard, isn't it? It's simulated education. It's, we look good, we look like we have a certain amount of education, but in fact, the majority of us simply have a certain amount of credentials. And I'm not sure I can come up with a counter-argument. What if education is, for the sake of argument, entirely ritualized? What if it is simply a question of showing up, going through the motions, and getting the letters after your name? What kind of check would there be on that? We'll agree for the sake of argument, again, that the consequences would be noteworthy. But where's the check? Where's the check in the system? Who's even paying attention to whether credentialing has anything to do with anything but credentialing? I guess the universities the, don't care. They get paid the same amount of money either way. Sure. All they have to do is turn out people with letters after their name. The corporations don't care. Where, where's the place in the, quote, system, close quote, for a remedy. I think that it, it basically puts the system in jeopardy. The system's no longer sustainable. And that's, that's the ultimate check on it. If you don't have people who are capable of thinking, capable of reading, capable of analytical thought, eventually what you have is a lot of followers and no leaders. That's an argument that's been used for years, and apparently it's out of vogue. Well, it may be out of vogue, but that doesn't make it less true. And it doesn't make it without consequences. I mean, look at what's going on with Enron right now. Look at what's going on with WorldCom and all of these other places in which unethical practices are leading to people trying to look good without any substance to it. I guess I didn't articulate clearly. I don't mean that there won't be consequences. I said that there would be. What I meant when I talked about a check on the system was a check that stops this sort of downward spiral before Armageddon. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Yeah. People have to realize that Armageddon is coming. Right now the check doesn't exist. They've forgotten the middle part. They pretend that as long as they keep the act up, as long as the simulation is in place, that it's the real thing. That's what I'm suggesting, is that the only way that you're going to create checks within the system is for somebody somewhere to start valuing something 
in terms of sustainability because what is going on right now in the relationship between corporations and education is not sustainable. It's not sustainable to merely have credentialing. If you don't have some substance behind the credentials, eventually something bad is going to happen. It's already starting. Will it happen before Armageddon comes? I don't know. Could it happen before Armageddon comes? Yes, of course it could. There are lots of ways in which people can know whether or not you have substance or not. But it's going to require a sense of public self. It's going to require a sense of sustainability being a good thing. It's going to have to be somebody who appreciates intellect, not because it can compete with you, but because it can enhance everybody's position at the same time. Substance is exactly the issue. We're talking about convincing a duopoly, if I may misuse that word for the moment, that is convinced that there is no substance except that which they assign. Well, then it's going to fall apart. They do not concede that there is anything to the student besides the grades they assign him, the credentials they give or withhold from him, and then pass him on to an economy that couldn't care less about the greater good or the collective good or anything but unenlightened self-interest in every specific case. Unenlightened self-interest is a really good term for this. These people think that they're acting in their best interest. They're not. They have to be enlightened. They are individually. In the cases of the corporations, they are acting in their individual best interest. It's the prisoner's dilemma. They are only acting in their best interest in the short term. Eventually, they will be hurt. Do you really think that the Arthur Anderson guys who are sitting in jail right now now feel that they acted in their best interest? You have a generation in power now that read Rachel Carson and said, gee, the resources are all getting used up. Well, let's use them up before we die and send the credit card bill to the next couple of generations. Or do you dispute that? I think it's a simplistic view. Because you also have people of that same generation who read Rachel Carson and are out there trying to change the economy to be more sustainable to actually save something for the next generation to come. Okay, so you're contesting, because, you're contesting the point of fact. Yes, there are contravailing forces. Just because they don't make CNN very often doesn't mean they don't exist. We're talking about universities here. You mentioned CNN. I take it you're using that as an example of legitimation. Yes. Or, well, circulation of information, but legitimation more in this case. Yes. Universities are the quintessential legitimation centers. They are about putting letters after people's names. Yes. There are a few universities that don't grant degrees, but they don't do well. They don't do well in the particular game that you're talking about. I think some of their students think they do very well. Sure, okay, yes. And they I do serve a purpose, and they do exist, and therefore they are part of the possibilities of the future. I'm not just being contentious. I'm trying to get at a very central dilemma, which is how do you reconcile the a priori notions of education or intelligence or skills or whatever you want to call it with the legitimation, the credentialing? So how do you reconcile the two? I, I think that what the problem that you're presenting is not reconcilable within its box. I'm suggesting to you though that to keep it in its box is an inaccurate assessment of what it is. I'm suggesting that there are contravailing forces that happen outside its box. I mean, I'm not trying to be difficult either. I'm just saying that it can be more complex, that you're not going to find, if education is simply credentialing, if it's a legitimation institution, and that only institutions call, who legitimate can be called universities. And if that then in turn is the only respectable place to go for your education, then you're stuck. But if people begin to look outside of that 
and say, okay, I want something more, I'm going to go to this institution that doesn't grant a degree, I'm not going to worry about whether or not I have a degree, I'm going to worry about whether or not I have a certain body of knowledge. Those people act upon the system as well. In other words, they're outside the box that you've created, but they're not outside interaction of human beings. And if those kind of things caught on, eventually the credential mills would be out of vogue. You can't act as if because they don't, they're not acceptable within the box, that they don't have influence on what happens inside the box. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're saying that my model is naive. Yes. In other words, if you limit me to only coming up with a solution from within the box, I'm not sure that I could. Then I would say that the solution could come before the whole thing falls apart. But it would require a cultural change. It would require a change in attitudes. It would require us to respect and reward people who don't live inside that box. And the universities aren't going to do that, and the corporations aren't going to do that. There are universities that do that, and there are corporations that do that. They don't make CNN, and they aren't very powerful right now. But they could grow into something important. So your answer would be, they are there if we need them. They are there if we want to use them, yes. Been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia, simulcasted on 104.3 cable and CFUV.UVIC.ca. First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson. for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com.